Well, Eli Konem, uh, thanks for joining us. Tell us, what is your reaction to these Al-Quds rallies that Iran is sponsoring around the world? Can you tell us about them? Chris, these Al-Quds rallies are hate fests that the Iranian regime sponsors, that they started with, uh, with taking power in Iran in 1979. Al-Quds in Arabic means Jerusalem. And uh, the point of these rallies is to so-called liberate Jerusalem from the Jews. That is what the Iranian regime hopes to do and what they aspire to do every day, whether um, through their terror proxy activity or through their nuclear weapons uh, building that they're doing every day advancing their nuclear program. And so if you look at footage from Iran, what they do is they have these huge um, rallies where people are either even paid by the government or are encouraged as they are in these autocratic countries to show up at these government sponsored rallies. And it's, a, it's also a complete hate fest. They were showing off um, their Khyber missile, which refers to um, a historical moment where it is believed that the Jews of the town of Khyber in Saudi Arabia in the early days of Islam were massacred. And so uh, naming this Iranian missile as Ibar is a reference to massacring Jews, and this is what they showed off in their Al Quds Day rally in Iran. What's interesting to note, Chris, is that we saw some footage on Twitter, and I've retweeted it on my own Twitter account from one town in Iran where you see protesters shouting in Farsi death to Palestine. My belief is the reason why these Iranian people are taking their own lives at risk and, and dissenting the government is because they don't buy into this anti-Semitism against Israel. They don't harbor any hatred towards the Jewish state. And in fact, they're tired of seeing the regime steal the country's resources to wage this relentless war against Israel when the Iranian people, many are just hungry and starving on the streets, mm. and they'd like to see resources spent on their own people. Yeah, speaking of the Palestinians in Haibar, there's video on Twitter as well uh, that shows many Palestinians shouting Haibar, uh, the reference you said about the genocide of the Jews. How has the U.S. intervened uh, in, in many of these uh, riots over the past several weeks on the Temple Mount, and what pressure have they been putting on the Israeli government? Chris, the Biden administration's intervention into the situation in Israel has been deeply disappointing. What we saw is that um, some weeks ago, there was the beginning of tensions as, uh, as, as we saw something unusual this last year where the holidays of Ramadan, Easter, and Passover all overlap. And whereas that could have been an opportunity for a peaceful interfaith coexistence moment, instead what we saw is many Palestinians take over what they call the Al Aqsa Mosque, which is on the Temple Mount, and uh, and there was rioting. They were shooting uh, uh, foreign objects outside out of the Temple Mount, mm -hmm. and when the Israelis were forced to act, what we saw is that the Biden administration was putting pressure on Israel. What specifically the pressure that the Biden administration put on Israel is a demand that Israelis use the language of, um, of maintaining the status quo on Jerusalem and on Al-Aqsa, rather than what the Israeli foreign minister had been saying previously, which was that Israel was guaranteeing freedom of worship. Now, what the Biden administration in essence is signaling to Israel is that Israel needs to stop giving the Jews freedom of worship and only use this language maintaining status quo. Well, what, what that means maintaining status quo is that Jews are not allowed up to the Temple Mount area, the Al-Aqsa area, and Jews are certainly not allowed to pray, otherwise um, they will be arrested. So it's a sad state of affairs, Chris, for us to see our US administration um, putting pressure on the state of Israel, mm. not allowing all, of all people, Jews are not allowed freedom of worship in the Jewish state. Yeah, another uh, difficult situation for Israel. Uh, I just came back from a trip, a tour of the uh, some of the Sunni Arab nations, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates. When you hear a different story, you hear actually, uh, I've heard privately that uh, some of these leaders, they actually support Israel's right to defend itself uh, there on the Temple Mount. But actually, to me, it was very enlightening to see how much they are embracing the Abraham Accords, 
how they see Iran as a mutual enemy. Talk to us more about uh, the development, the ongoing fulfillment of these historic agreements. The Abraham Accords has been a complete game changer in the Middle East, North Africa region, Chris. And I'm so happy to hear that you experienced that yourself visiting the Gulf Arab states. What the Abraham Accords did, and it was it was very nicely followed up recently in the Negev summit that Israel hosted on mm -hmm. its own soil, was um, create a new Middle East in which what we see is that countries have a choice between um, coexistence and bridge building and really accepting a Jewish presence in the region in the form of the state of Israel, or unfortunately those like the Iranian regime and its proxies, which are rejectionists and uh, advocate constantly and fund and train terrorists, uh, refuse to coexist peacefully with their neighbors and, uh, and ultimately have hegemonic ambitions for mm -hmm. the entire region. Final question, uh, Ellie. We have talked before about the uh, ongoing negotiations with the, uh, uh, in Vienna about the Iranian nuclear deal. A few weeks ago, people thought it was 24 or 36 hours from being signed, but now it's gone on. Uh, why do you see the delay and, and what do you see about these, uh, this agreement? Could it happen fairly soon? Chris, you know, I can never rule out that the Biden administration will um, will give in to Iranian demands and that we will see an Iran deal emerge. However, the sticking point has been Iran's demand that the United States lift the foreign terrorist organization designation off of their IRGC uh, organization, which is which the U.S. designated as an FTO, and rightfully so. Um, the IRGC has American blood on its hands. And mm -hmm. there's no good reason for the United States to even consider lifting this FTO designation. Now, if you speak to um, people like Ambassador Nathan Sales of the Trump administration, who was a leading force for the FTO designation, what he'll explain is that the designation um, gives the United States powers like, first of all, not allowing anyone associated with IRGC into the United States. It also allows victims of terror to take any IRGC related entities and peoples to court. Um, the, the designation gives the United States many powers that no other designation does. And, uh, and it's obvious that for that reason, it means a lot to the Iranian regime. And so they are demanding that the U.S. lift the designation. I certainly hope, and you're hearing from many both Democrat and Republican members of Congress who are, have voiced their concern to the Biden administration that there's no good reason to lift that FTO designation. Yeah, and there's certainly great concern here uh, in Israel that they would uh, lift that designation as well. Eli Conan, thanks for joining us and uh, giving us your analysis and expertise. Thank you. Great. Great to be with you.